Hello and welcome again into my Zen, all ye denizens of dreams. I'm Stephen Berlin and today I'm going to be talking about the dynamics of dream emergence. Yes, I know I said I'd be talking about something else, but uh, before you go out and proclaim that the curse of serpent speaks in forked tongue, I'm going to go ahead and subtitle this Geography and Navigation in Dreams, Part 1. It was my intention to discuss your four primary choices for getting around in a dream, for getting to your destinations, and then uh, outline the advantages and or disadvantages of each. But in uh, preparing that, I got thinking, hmm, you know, before I start talking about how to uh, navigate the dream state, it's kind of important to know what we're navigating and one important feature of the state that you really need to be aware of before we intrude upon it with our lucidity and attempt to influence it. So, what are we navigating? Well, you all should know this by now. We're navigating ourselves. You're navigating the unfolding contents of your unconscious mind in all the glory, splendor, uh, power, good, evil, uh, potential, that's there, as described by all the great depth psychologists, you know, Freud, Jung, Adler, all those guys. It's all your own personal, private, unique, inner self. And I want you to know, I don't presume to tell you how to navigate yourself. If you disagree with anything I say in any of these talks, uh, do I have any idea, you know, what's going on inside your dreams? No. And I don't presume to. <laughs> don't, don't even want to. And, and, and the same is true. So anything I say is not necessarily the gospel. Uh, at least, you know, in many cases not for your own reality. Okay, well, I need to move on to what's important about the state that we need to understand before we start navigating it. Well, the dream state is different than our waking state for one obvious reason. Our waking state is a, appears to our sensory apparatus is relatively stable. What's outside your front door today is prob probably going to be outside your front door tomorrow. Now, in dreams, things are constantly changing, constantly moving. So your dreams are moving forward. In fact, your dreams are constantly in a major transform motion. Pardon the word, but I, I love it. I'd give it as a definition for dreaming, transform motion. Because your dreams are moving ahead to, uh, really quickly by association. And when I say association, I mean every synonym of association, by correlation, by, by approximation, by analogy and metaphor and wordplay, like alliteration and rhyme. It, it, your dream is making all these connections and it's moving forward by those connections which will be better demonstrated by an example I'm going to give. But before I do that, there's one kind of transform motion that needs specific emphasis, and that is homologous variation. Now, the term homologous variant was coined by a Swiss biologist or biochemist, Claude Rifat, R-I-F-A-T, and I regret to say Claude is dead. He died in 2002, but the, Thankfully, before Claude died, I think in the mid-80s, he gave us this cult classic, uh, Conscious Dreaming and Controlled Hallucinations. And in this, he coins, although he coins it the French term for it, so I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> I'm sure the nation of France will be grateful for that. Okay, uh, but it's homologous variant. I'm going to spell that because I think it's an important word. H-O-M-O-L-O-G-O-U-S. V-A-R-I-A-N-T-S. Now, Claude had, in a pre-sleep state, a like brief vision of a mushroom, which he would call a disattenuated image. And in his vision of the mushroom, he watched it in a matter of just a couple of seconds transform into a candle in an ashtray. And Claude concluded from that, accurately, I think, that our memories in store things uh, by pattern recognition. In other words, we don't have a, a candle department in our mind and an ashtray department in our memory and a, and a, and a mushroom department. And that, that what happened in this little in this short uh, visual that he had was when he saw a mushroom, 
that his mind recognized the pattern as resembling uh, and being connected with the image of an of a candle in an ashtray, which Claude apparently had seen sometime in his life or imagined. So, so that was a homologous variation. So that's a very important concept. Let me move on now to a dream to demonstrate these principles. Now I've been having some issues with my computer lately. And so one thing I've been checking, my hard drive space is rapidly disappearing. So I checked it and, and uh, my computer presented me with a pie chart, which shows you what slice of the pie you still have left you know, to use. Well, anyway, I'm dreaming the other morning, and I dream of uh, being in front of my computer screen, and I'm looking at my system resources again, evidently. But instead of a pie chart, my dream presented me with a bar graph. Now, I think the pie chart was the, was the day residue, but instead of a homologous variation of that, I, my mind, I believe, used an association to a bar graph because they're both pictorial representations of data. So now I'm looking at it, now I'm in my dream and I'm looking at this bar graph of my system resources and it's two-dimensional and it suddenly becomes three-dimensional. Well, that's a homologous variation. Okay, now I see this three-dimensional bar graph across my screen and I thought to myself, you know, this looks like a city skyline. And no sooner did I think city skyline than, than the screen transformed again and the two bars in the middle became really tall, the, the, the twin tower bars, you'd say, of a city skyline. So now... It's gone to another homologous jump, so to speak, or variation. And, and then when I realized it was the New York City skyline, the whole, the bar graph changed into like a postcard of New York City. And then it became animated. And in my dream, they fell at the same time. But in my dream, these two bars start collapsing. You all know the visual on that. And it's coming down, and I'm looking at this in horror. I, I, it wasn't the same horror I felt at 9-11. Uh, this was a, in this case, was the horror of seeing my computer crashing. And so the towers came out, and fortunately they collapsed into my computer's footprint. And anyway, so then the, the, the crash screen came up, which in Windows normally says, you know, <laughs> contact your system administrator. But in, in my case in the dream, it had two big words there in black letters, havoc and wrecked. Well, then I woke up and I realized, and I got thinking, like, you know, I, I analyzed my dreams pretty quickly. Well, the associations are still kind of fresh. And I thought wrecked. Well, I could see where the word wrecked came from because uh, my computer crashed, that the towers came crashing down. And, you know, you talk about car crashes, you talk about car wrecks, they're kind of synonymous. So wrecked, when my computer crashed, made some sense. But how about havoc? So I'm sitting there going, havoc, havoc, wrecked, havoc, wrecked, wrecked, havoc wreaked havoc. You know, you hear that the tornado has swept through the Midwest and wreaked havoc. Bad financial news wreaked havoc on Wall Street. Wreaked havoc. So my mind went from crashed to wrecked to wreaked havoc. All in just a matter of, this, this all happened like in 10, 10 to 15 seconds. Tops all of these homologous variations and associations. Now, I do want to point out that it's possible that wreaked havoc maybe wasn't wordplay. It could have been day residue. Maybe I walked by the television or the, heard on the radio. Maybe somebody used the expression and I didn't quite consciously catch it. Maybe I passed the newsstand and it was on some headline. I don't consciously remember it. That's another possibility if you watch that discourse. So anyway, uh, I won't, we need to get going here. And uh, so we coined a new word. Maybe we, maybe we started a new dance craze. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Come on, baby, do the transfer motion. You know, I like to give lucid dreaming's true profundity some fecundity. And I utilize the tools of brevity and levity. And that's about it in a nutshell.